one and all welcome in week four of the course and today we are going to continue the topic related to uh, the relationship between money and happiness this meeting will be focused on consumerism so in this whole lecture about relationship between money and happiness you will learn the link between money and our well-being but the reason why we discuss it is that we want to explain why this relationship between money and happiness is sometimes stronger, sometimes is weaker. So we try to take a look at the mechanisms of happiness or well-being that can be built based on money, purchase, material goods. Later on in this presentation you will see what we can do in order to increase our well-being and happiness while spending. Of course, this kind of mechanism may not be universal for specific cultures. So during the meeting, we are going to have a discussion what's the function of culture related to relationship between money and happiness. Let's start to discuss this slide. This table can be found in the textbook in one of the chapters. In this chapter, uh, related to how we learn and how we build our consumer habits, we can see that consumers, they probably build the idea on how to create their happiness based on specific types of approaching to uh, buying products. Consumers, they, they tend to learn from experience. So for instance, as you see here, there are some specific stages that describe how we can learn from experience. So for instance, if consumers think, okay, I need to buy goods, on one hand to satisfy basic needs but also to increase my happiness my well-being they can go through those stages for instance the first stage it's hypothesizing people tend to collect some information about yeah what kind of products can lead to satisfaction of needs they have basic and more complex ones and then those needs can be satisfied by uh, different products but also different types of marketing actions. Then when people start to think, start to search for products that can uh, satisfy their needs, they are exposed. So they take a look at the products, they analyze it uh, visually. And later on, based on the experience, they learn whether a specific product or maybe a service can satisfy their needs. And later on, after the encoding phase, consumers they tend to integrate their knowledge about specific products, services that can help them to build their well being. The whole process can be pretty simple, in it's based on cognitive learning. First of all, people need to feel a drive or motivation. And then this motivation can be reinforced, can be triggered by a specific cue. If an activity, an action occurs, so uh, you see an interesting product and you think, okay, maybe uh, consuming this chocolate or buying this uh, pair of shoes uh, will help you to satisfy your needs. If you are satisfied, if you know that you know, this kind of product really helps you to satisfy your need, then probably you will repeat those actions. And as a consequence, specific consumer uh, knowledge occurs. Here in this graph, we can see uh, one of the examples. So for instance, a consumer looks for a new product 
um, that uh, hopefully will satisfy needs and learns how this product can satisfy. So for instance, if I have a appropriate knowledge on how a product satisfies my need, then I use the product and then I can be happy about uh, those effects. Of course, this process is in real life more complicated. Those mechanisms, they create specific network of knowledge where nodes, so the major part of this knowledge, communicate uh, with each other uh, to some extent guiding consumer behavior. At some point consumers learn what increases their well-being, uh, increases their happiness uh, and what does not. One of the most interesting effects related to how we gain knowledge about products and to what extent this knowledge is uh, related to relationship between money and happiness is this effect, the uh, just of the reach effect. This effect describes a situation where people tend to want things that they truly do not need. On one hand, we learn what products create opportunity to satisfy needs, but later on, as a consequence of buying things and thinking that material goods can increase happiness, people, they tend to buy more and more of products that basically they do not need uh, later on. Maybe they need it for a minute, maybe for a day, but later on those products become useless. What is also interesting, they found that it happens in specific groups of... So what is important is a function of, uh, of a group. So this effect is related to to whom you compare to. So for instance, if a consumer compares his or her own income to a group that has slightly lower or higher income, this effect to buy more things that are unnecessary, it's relatively uh, smaller. To great extent, this need to buy things and overall this effect of just of reach effect is strongly influenced by marketing and media. So basic people learn that if they belong to a certain group they need to possess some types of products. So for instance you move to a new house, let's say uh, it's a beautiful area and you see that your neighbors uh, have cars. And then if you ride on a bike, you think, hmm, maybe I also should have a bike. Maybe it would be useful for me to buy a car. And then you buy a car, maybe a second one, maybe a third one. Maybe then you buy uh, a bike, for instance, uh, and so on. And that, uh, that happens. To a great extent, that can be influenced by, by the media, but also the reference group. As a consequence, this is what uh, researchers labeled hedonic treadmill occurs. What happens is that people, they tend to obtain more and more material goods over time. And then if we own material goods, then we also want to uh, more. And then if we know more, we want to uh, increase the process of obtaining goods uh, as much as possible. So this need to possess uh, material things increases even faster. As a consequence, we are never satisfied and always want more. So overall, 
we want things, we buy them, and we see that other people have more, so we want to buy more, and this whole process just speeds up. A consequence of this psychological or social mechanism leads to upscale spending. As you will see later on in the e-lecture on conspicuous consumption, this kind of problem has or may have tremendous effects on consumers. This effect can be nicely illustrated if you take a look at this graph. That graph compares income that people actually were getting and what they really wanted to get. So in 1978, the income, average income, United States was around $20,000, but people wanted to have two or three thousand more. And as you see over the years, that effect is constant. It means that we always want more money because we see an opportunity to buy more and more. To some extent, we may expect that this motivation is a consequence of fast adapting to uh, pleasure, that it's related to buying the goods, but also to some extent it's an outcome of pressure of reference group or a consequence of exposure to media. Let's ask this question. Maybe money does not substantially affect happiness or well-being. Or maybe we are not spending it right. So money itself is not the problem. The problem is maybe how we spend it. So the relationship between money and happiness is weak because to a great extent we do not know how to spend it. So researchers wanted to investigate this problem. What we can do as consumers uh, in order to better spend the money. If we think, okay, let's spend money to increase happiness, how we should uh, do Researchers, they suggested this solution. As you see, we have five ways of increasing happiness through spending money. Buy experiences, make it a treat, buy time, pay now, consume later, invest in others. Let's take a look at those ideas. To a great extent, they are based on research. What was found in research that experiences increase happiness to a larger extent, so services, not products. As you can find in studies by Kilovich and his colleagues, they found that basically if consumers make experiential purchases, more of them are happier. If consumers make material purchases, less than are happier. Let's take a look at this effect. As you see here, people predict that after um, uh, purchase, the level of happiness, if they buy material goods, would be way higher than after buying experiential good, uh, experiential uh, purchases. So for instance, buying services. But later on, they've measured long-term effects of those purchases. As you see here, if you would compare interior purchases and experiential purchases, level of satisfaction of consumers was higher for the second type of purchases. 4.91 uh, versus 5.7. This effect was similar after four weeks post-consumption. So think for a second about people who do this uh, crazy stuff, like go into mud and uh, 
to participate in a Ramnageddon or other events. Why they do that? Why they spend their time and of course money for doing this kind of crazy activities? In this case, when people finish their run, they do not get an award, they do not get a gold, bronze or silver medal, they get a orange band. Why do you think that happens? What's the reason why people are not awarded in this way that they get a medal, but they get an orange band? What's the reason? Okay, let's move on. So, we can ask a question, what kind of experiences we should buy in order to build our happiness? First of all, research shows that we should buy experiences that create social connections. An experience that brings people together uh, creates social connections and thus builds happiness. Also, what was found that experiences that makes um, a specific uh, event memorable also makes consumers happier than other types of event. Also, what was found is that if consumers select experience that helps consumers to uh, build or that are close to their identity, also experiences that help to build high level of happiness. And finally, if an experience provides a unique opportunity and makes a specific comparison with other effects difficult, so for instance, you participate in a Ramageddon, in this uh, uh, experience with uh, running through mud, to what kind of other experience would you compare that? Going to cinema, buying um, a coffee? Of course not. It's a completely unique experience that you will probably remember throughout your whole life. So maybe if you would think next time what kind of wedding gift buy your friends or maybe a members of your family, Instead of buying those uh, material goods, maybe you would go for buying a trip. Let's say champagne, day trip and tasting. Or maybe a, a trip to a castle or something else that your family members, your friends could enjoy after getting married. In real life we can find multiple examples where material goods or money is transferred to a specific experience. One of the examples is Google. So instead of uh, paying the employees money or offering them uh, materialistic bonuses, they switched into offering experiential bonuses. So instead of uh, 5,000 euros of uh, um, reward, people were getting options to go for a, a nice trip and then uh, experience something unique um, after work. Okay, let's move uh, to other examples. Also, this theory suggests that people should uh, make the treat. So instead of drinking alone, maybe it's better to drink with friends. Research shows that people habituate to pleasure very easily. We can say that abundance is the enemy of appreciations. So uh, the more chocolate we eat, the less we enjoy it. In research, they found that uh, satisfaction can be related to uh, um, to novelty. We enjoy a new car better in the beginning than later on. Simply enjoyment of uh, 
having materialistic good just wears off. What we can also say is that making it a treat is needed because we know, hopefully from other uh, slides, that wealth may decrease enjoyment. So people, if they want to enjoy the money they have and the way how they spend, they basically should focus on what to do in order to uh, uh, create a pleasure experience from the purchases. We know from experimental studies that exposure to money, so uh, thinking about the money, made people less happier about consumed chocolate and also reduced enjoyment. So it means that if you're thinking about consumption and you want to increase happiness based on the consumption, maybe thinking about uh, how expensive it is or thinking about money will not help. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, you can see evidence of making a treat is effective. In one of the experiments, they ask a group of participants to abstain from eating a chocolate for one week. At the same time, the other group could eat it as much as they wanted. Excellent, right? But on the other hand, what they found in this experiment that later on, after this week, those people who needed to abstain from eating chocolate, they were enjoying the bar more. So it means that waiting makes sense. The same effect was re uh, reported when people were thinking about driving a car. They found that the more expensive car, the more pleasure was reported when thinking about driving. So, to some extent, if a pleasure is distant in time, then it can be related to increased uh, pleasure when people truly experience it. Also, to increase happiness from money, we may think about buying time, because uh, time is often seen as money. We know that people tend to spend some time in order to save some money. So for instance, uh, instead of driving and saving gas, people can, let's say, walk. Or maybe can wait uh, in a long line while uh, it's possible to get some free food. Also, what was found that people usually spend more time on things they love. However, what was found that instead of spending more time on what people really like, people they spend things on activities that tend to increase stress and tension. So, for instance, people spend too much time at work because they think that, yeah, maybe sooner or later they will be able to consume the outcomes of their work. But also, what was found that instead of being active, people, they prefer to do some passive um, activities, like, for instance, passively watching TV instead of exercising. So, yeah, how to buy uh, time, how to increase your happiness. Maybe instead of this old washing machine, you would go for this kind of cleaning robot. Why not? And research found that yeah, if people do that, if they buy equipment that saves time, they are pretty happy. Another effect that can increase happiness based on purchases is pay now, consume later. Researchers found that if we pay electronically by credit cards on App Store, this delay between payment and consumption can to some extent increase happiness. Electronic payments 
also increase the distance between act of buying and the effect. So, on your wallet. So, if you uh, pay from your wallet, you immediately see that some cash is gone. But if you pay electronically, uh, you do not experience that heavily when you pay out of your pocket, when you take out your wallet and you pay. So, the searchers found that paying electronically is less painful uh, if compared to paying with uh, cash. They also found that to some extent our happiness is related to how fast specific ordered goods can be delivered home. So was it paying now and consume later is it is effective because people tend to derive more joy from things that are coming to us in the future compared to when we have them. So if you pay for a new book now, you wait for this book. According to this research, this waiting makes you happy. Not having the, uh, uh, the product in your hands, but the whole waiting increases your well-being. Studies show that people may tend to be more excited a week before going on holidays than weeks after the holidays. Also, another study showed that people generate more emotional images of Christmas in November than in January when looking better their experiences. It means that when we wait for something, it's more meaningful, we expect more joy out of it. The reason why is that is that future is more difficult to compare. So, we cannot compare two pair of shoes when we think about buying them. So, this excitement that can be related to buying shoes can be way higher than if we buy both pair of shoes and then try them on at home, for instance. If something hasn't taken place, it's ambiguous. It means that it's less clear, uh, it's less evident. That's why consumers, they create this illusion that it's related to increased level of happiness before they buy. And this happiness is higher than after the purchase. In the US, almost every president enters office with higher approval rates than when, it's, uh, when he or he. He leaves it. Why is that? Because if a new president is selected, people expect lots from him, that he will make important decisions. But reality is completely or can be completely different. Another reason why pay now and consume later makes us happy is that when we have this time when we wait for something it feels like uh, it's for free so this waiting is something additional and maybe that's why consumers feel that uh, it's also something good why not but another explanation of this is is that this time for waiting for a specific product to come home, for instance, uh, is after we experience this pain of paying. So costs were paid and now we can just sit down, relax and wait until the product is delivered. Interesting, huh? Okay, let's move on and discuss final mechanism related to how we can increase happiness through spending. Invest in others. That's simple. Several studies demonstrated that spending money on other people makes us more happy than spending uh, money on uh, ourselves. Why is that? 
They found in one of the studies that personal spending was unrelated to happiness, but higher pro-social spending was related to happiness. As you see here, I provided this statistical uh, data to show that this effect for spending on others is rather small, but it's statistically significant, not bad. Research found that employees who devoted more time of their bonuses to pro-social spending experiences, uh, they showed greater happiness after receiving the bonus. It didn't matter whether a bonus was large or small, the only matter was whether it was spent on pro-social on or not on pro-social activities. So, if we know that this kind of pattern exists, why we do not spend money uh, on others? Because we tend to think that personal spending, so spending on ourselves, makes us happier than pro-social spending. Yeah, why to give others, right? Uh, what will leave, uh, to, to, to what kind of effects that will lead, right? Uh, but still, that does not make people happy. Even though people, they do that over and over again, that does not lead to happiness. So spending on ourselves is maybe not the best idea. Similarly, people think that spending money on material goods makes uh, themselves happier than spending money on experiences. Also, the opposite is true. Nevertheless, even though people tend to think that spending on themselves or buying more material goods increase happiness, still there are some ways of changing this tendency. First of all, as you've probably seen, buying experiences, making the treat, buying time, paying now and consuming later, and investing in others can overcome those two negative tendencies. Done at all, they also suggest other ways to increase happiness. So uh, she suggests that it's better to buy many small pleasures rather than a few large ones. So instead of uh, buying a large chocolate, maybe it's better to buy a few smaller ones. Not maybe eat them uh, the same day, but uh, wait until you consume all of them. Also, they suggest, researchers suggest that we should avoid many warranties and other forms of overpriced insurance. Why do you think this uh, may affect consumers? Why we should avoid additional warranties? Dan and others, they suggest that we should be aware that comparing products may not lead to, uh, to increase our happiness. Finally, they suggest that we should pay close attention to the happiness of others. So we should, if we want to build our happiness, take a closer look at others, what's important to others. To conclude this part, I would like to focus on this graph. This graph shows consumers' goals. Core element, so element related to being, is uh, life themes and values. Then we have less important consumer goals, doing, related to current concerns or consumer uh, intentions or consumption intentions. Then we have elements of having, possessing things, related to uh, benefits that people seek or preferences. So, if we know that consumption does not lead to happiness very often, maybe to some extent that can be explained based on this theory. So, if we do things that are not related to our values or life projects, then it's maybe really hard to build happiness and well being. So, maybe that's why investing in others taking care of others is an element of being. 
it's related to values, right? And maybe that's why when we spend on others, it's related to our being. Of course, we do that, uh, but then the core element is being simply. The same for buying experiences. Having, yeah, things come and go, but experiences, they build our identity. They help us to be. So they are related to our, our life projects, to some extent, our life themes and values. Okay, money happiness. As you've probably seen, it's complicated. First of all, there is an effect of asymmetry. So less versus more money. Of course, we always want to have more money. But as you've seen, if you have more and more, we less enjoy it. And also, as a consequence of different environmental influences, consumers, they tend to have more and more every year and they are not happy with what they make. What's really important is that experience or experiences and positive social relationship make more uh, people more happy. But on the other hand, if we focus too much on earning money, that can lead to social isolation and rather does not help economic growth. Also, we know from research related to queuing consumers that luxury good may increase external motivation and deteriorate individual and social well-being. So thinking about money, thinking about luxury goods is not good for your own well-being and also may affect negatively relationships with other people. And let's conclude this part with this statement by Da. Money buys happiness, but it buys less than most people think. In the final part of this presentation, I would like to focus on specific theory. It's related to consumer culture, CCT. We know from studies related to culture that culture is a complex phenomenon. On a macroenvironmental level, there's a relationship between culture, so different rituals, habits, specific societal knowledge, to subculture and social class. In this part, a brief one, I would like to focus on culture and social class. To understand consumerism, we probably would need to take a look at relationships on a small scale, microenvironmental factors, relationship between groups, family and friends. That's not really important at this point. Culture, it's really complex. It's related to language, specific customs, beliefs, myths, rituals, food that is consumed, and many more. At this point, in order to understand how money influences happiness and how we can understand consumer culture, we are going to focus on specific customs, beliefs or rituals that affect consumers. The CCT, consumer culture theory, says that Culture or consumer culture is basically related to how consumers interact with uh, markets and how they find themselves in. So this specific theory tries to explain how markets and buying money itself changes uh, our beliefs, changes our uh, our behavior, but also to some extent relationships with other people. Thompson, the author of this theory, says that consumer culture represents social arrangement in which 
the relations between culture that people live in and resources and between meaningful ways of life and symbolic and material resources, they depend on markets. So in this sense, markets shape how people go through their lives. A consequence of this notion is that we can specifically investigate those areas where consumer culture can be identified. The first area is related to socio-historic pattern of consumption. So to investigate that, we can take a look at institutional and structural forces that shape people's way of consumption, so how people consume things. So for instance, to understand consumer behavior, it's really important to also see how people transfer from one social class to another. So what kind of things they do, what kind of things they buy in order to go through the uh, social class. Also, they found that consumer culture can be st studied if we take a look at consumer identity. It's related to uh, the individual and how uh, she or he shapes self-identity use uh, using uh, resources that are delivered by markets and how this identity varies from a person to person. Third element that can be studied is marketplace culture. So this marketplace culture uh, is related or cultures are related to relationship between markets itself and consumer networks. And finally, how consumers interpret communication that can be found in the marketplaces. So how they do respond to those and how they interpret, of course. This theory suggests that besides those areas, there are some specific consequences of consumerism. One of the consequences is that consumer culture tends to erode national cultures because the culture that it's associated with specific brands, products, and so on, becomes more important than naturally occurring cultural identity of specific individuals. Do you think that makes sense? Could you give an example? Consumer culture creates superficial social interaction and encourages people to be competitive rather than cooperative. And again, do you think that makes sense? Could you give some examples or maybe counterexamples? And finally, this theory based on data suggests that consumerism is regarded as bad for the environment because it encourages really excessive use of different neutral resources. Natural resources that uh, are not always easy to be replenished. A final slide I would like to use to draw attention to the problem of a social class. As you probably noticed, one of the elements of uh, consumer culture is social class. In order to understand how the consumer culture develops, it's really important how people go through social uh, ladder. On one hand, we can distinguish between upper class, middle class and lower class. But for people who study consumer behavior, 
it's really interesting to see how people create and use life chances and how they possess goods depending on a specific class. So here you see in the middle Weber's view on social class. We have upper class, middle class and lower class. Current perspective is it doesn't matter whether it's a upper class, middle class or lower class. It's a perspective that treats all those elements of social classes as a subculture. So marketers, they address their advertisements toward those kind of groups. Try to think about this question. How this framework can be and is utilized by the marketers? So what actually they do in order to address upper class, middle class and lower class? Thank you for your attention.